Well, several years ago, Richard Petty was, was racing, and he had uh, lost 45 races in a row. Now, those of you who are NASCAR fans know who Richard Petty is. Well, this year, he was driving again in the Daytona 500. And something really weird happened. Now, if you're a NASCAR fan, you probably even remember this event. Uh, I didn't see it, but you may remember it. So Richard Petty, he's in, he's in third place, last lap. The number one and two guys are right on each other's tails, or one's right on this tail of the car in front of him, and he's in third place back here. The number two guy clips the number one guy. He spins out. He doesn't go completely out of control, but he goes off into the, to the infield for just a brief second. Then he bounces back on the track. He catches up to the number one guy now, who was number two. And when he catches up to the number one guy, he forces him into the outside wall. They crash. They go into the inner. They hop out of their cars, and they're just beating each other up. Richard Petty drives. Checkered flag. Now you say, wait a second. No one expected that. I mean, it's the last lap. Everyone expects the number one guy at the last lap, unless he's passed by the number two guy, that he's going to win the race. Nobody expected him to win that race. It's not what we would have expected. Well, the race, it seemed already won, didn't it? Last lap. But then the unexpected happened. It's kind of like this. You are the very best candidate for the new job in your organization. By far, you have the best qualifications, you have the experience, you have the ability to pull off the job, but instead, the boss hires his best friend who is nowhere able to do the job, but simply because he was a friend, he got hired. That's not fair. You're the best athlete in an event. You made it to the Olympics. You're the very best in your class. There's no one better, and everyone knows you're the best. You're at the Olympics. The day before your event happens, you come down with a horrible case of intestinal flu, which means you cannot do your event. You don't even participate. That's not fair. The Arab nations, after Israel became a nation, powerful, multiple, lots of people, lots of uh, resources to attack this small little nation of Israel. And when the wars began, there were 67, 73 with the Yom Kippur, when those began, everyone thought the Arab nations were just going to wipe Israel into the sea, just wipe them off the face of the map. But instead, God intervenes. And those that are in power don't even win the battle. They get routed. As a matter of fact, the Egyptians made a claim that they swore they heard 500 tanks going across the desert. And they turned tail and run. It was five tanks. Five tanks. That's not what one expects. One expects whoever has the biggest army, the most resources, are going to win the battles. It's not what we would expect to happen. You would say, oh, these are flukes. These are anomalies. These are one-offs. No, this happens all the time. You've seen it. You know. You've seen things like this happen before. When you say, this is just not fair. No, I have to say, life is not fair. That is, life under the sun is not fair. It never has been. It never will be. Yet, in the midst of that truth, here is another one. God is good, God is just, and God is sovereign. Life is not fair under the sun. Things that we expect to happen don't happen, and that which we don't expect to happen actually happens. We often do not understand what God is doing. We don't see everything in this world that he's doing. But a bigger overriding question is not, why did this happen to me? The bigger overriding question is, do I still trust God in spite of what happened to me? That's really the question we have to answer. Because life is not fair under the sun, 
and unexpected things are going to happen to us, even we play by all the rules, we work hard, we, we cross all of our T's and dot all of our I's, life still happens. It's not fair. Life may not seem fair or just, but God is both fair and just. So what do we do? What do we do when life happens to us? How do we respond? What is the correct measure that we should take? Which direction should we go? This is what Solomon wants to address today. What is your normal reaction when life slaps you in the face? Think. He now turns to address calamities that everyone encounters in life. Everyone experiences calamities. So he wants to address that. Look at verses 11 and 12 of chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes. He says, Again I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. Life happens. What do we do? How do we respond to crises in life? Because it's going to encounter, every one of us are going to encounter, in fact, you probably had crises this week that you encountered. We all encounter them. How do we handle them? So he starts a new unit of thought by using the phrase again. In other words, he wants us to, to, to remember some of the things he said before, but this is a new unit of thought. That's why we broke it off last week at verse number 10. Again, I want to tell you these things. Again, I want to share with you. This is what I've learned as I've lived my life under the sun. Remember, under the sun simply means human existence on this earth. In contrast to that which is above the sun, that is in the heavenly realm where truth resides eternally, where the throne of God is. Solomon is looking at the, at the randomness of life from a human perspective. It's not that he has forgotten God's sovereignty. It's not that he has forgotten that God is good, that God is just, that God is sovereign. He's not forgotten any of that stuff. He's simply saying, this is what I've seen on the earth. This is what I've experienced in my lifetime under the sun. It's from a human, per you know, we, we say, well, I watched the sunrise this morning, or I watched the sunset this evening. Well, technically, that's not true. The sun doesn't rise and the sun doesn't set. The earth is spinning. But from our human perspective, it appears the sun rises and it appears the sun sets. That's a human perspective. That's what Solomon is telling us from a human perspective, what he's experienced. The fastest should win the race. The, most, the, the army with the most resources and man should win the battle. But that doesn't always happen. Because calamity is part and parcel of human existence, outcomes are not as expected. You can't say, if I do this, this will definitely happen. That may not be the case. It may not happen. Something unexpected may happen instead. We, are, we shouldn't be surprised when hardships happen in life. We know them. That's under the sun. There are hardships in our life. We can't guarantee what's, what's going to happen because life is so unpredictable. We don't know what's coming next. We, only God knows. Wisdom, skill, and hard work can promote but not guarantee success. In other words, you want to be a fool or do you want to be wise? Well, you want to be wise and you want to work hard and you want to have good skills, but it doesn't guarantee success because calamity happens to us all. What do we do? How do we respond? What's the correct measure? Now, you may get caught in this word chance, and we think like a chance. You know, I roll dice, and it's a chance, or I go gambling, and it's a chance. That's not the, what the word means. It's not an like, idea of chance. The idea is an occurrence or an event. So chance, an, occurrent, or an occurrence or an event happens to us all, and often they are evil. They are not good. Timing and chance affect the outcome more than skill or ability, is what Solomon says. You may have all the skill, you may have all the ability, you may be the right person at the right time, but timing and chance, outcomes and events happen where the unexpected occurs. People call this time and chance, ah, oh, ah, oh, 
the luck of the draw, the right place at the right time, the way the cookie crumbles if it's something bad. But for us believers, that's not how we look at it, is it? For us believers, we understand it differently. We see it as the incomprehensible activities of a God who loves us dearly and wants the best in our life. That's how we see it. He works things out for his eternal purposes and for his glory. We don't often often see the bigger picture. In Isaiah, he said this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. So when we see these random events coming into our lives, we don't see them as random events. No. We see them as the incomprehensible activity of God who is working all things according to his eternal purpose for his glory and our good. So we don't say, ah, oh, that's the luck of the draw. Oh, that's how the cookie crumbles. Ah, oh, no. No, God is sovereign. Our confidence is in the loving care of our Heavenly Father. Regardless of the circumstances around us, regardless of the crisis, the event, the evil event that comes into our lives, God is sovereign. A man put a board up on part of his land, and on the board it was written, placard, sign, I will give this field to the one who is really contented, content in life. When an applicant came, he asked, are you contented? And the general answer was, I am contented. And his reply then of the man was, then why do you want my field? Good question. Not really contented if you want more, is it? If we are truly content, then why do we always want more than we have? It is wise to be content, to trust in our loving Heavenly Father in spite of the evil circumstances in our life. The providence of God. He cares. As the song says, He loves us. It's for His glory and our good. No one knows his time. Now, he could be talking about the time of death, that's possible, or he could be talking about the time of, a, of, a, uh, of an evil event that comes into a person's life. It could be both, or it could, they, they could be both, or either or. But the idea is no one knows when it's going to happen. It's, that's why it's called unexpected. It's unexpected. We have no control over the evil times that befall us. We could do all the right things, and the evil time could still befall us. We have no control over that. You can have it all together, but time and chance will attack you. And the only thing you can do is respond correctly. There are so many events beyond human control that we encounter in life. What are we going to do with them? What am I going to do with those events? The only thing that we can control is our response to the events. You can't control the events, Solomon says, but you can control your response to the events. How do you handle evil times? How do you handle trials in your life? You remember George uh, Georg Mueller, George Mueller who had the orphanage, and he, by faith, took care of children in his orphanage? This was an address at his funeral, and it went like this. Yet he had trials, both many and heavy. But if I were asked, when have you seen him most triumphant and joyous in his trust in God? I should reply, when, with a beaming face, he has expressed his unbound confidence in God that the trial must be one of the all things that work together for good. Every weakness or trial being cast upon God became to him a source of strength. In response to that infinite love which called him from, from a life of sin as a young man, he loved him, everybody and everything, so that the highest pleasure was found in seeking to please him who he esteemed his highest privilege to serve. That's how he responded to trials. These are one of those things that work together for good. It's wise that we hope and trust. Hope, remember, hope isn't like I wish for something. Hope is a confident expectation in God's promises. God spoke, I believe. That's hope. Not just, oh, I wish, I hope it's, I hope it's 75 tomorrow. No one's, no one's disagreeing with me. You're tired of the heat too, huh? Yeah, so that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a confident expectation that God is going to do what God is going to do. That's hope. It is wise for us to be hopeful people because we trust God's promises. In Psalm 42, we read this. In a person who was, David writing this, he's down. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. 
So when everything around you crashes, and even inside you're just in turmoil, David says, hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And then he closes with two similes, two examples. And there are a fish in a net and a bird in a snare. And basically what he's saying is, listen, if the bird and the fish would have known where the net and the snare was, they would have gone the other direction. At least they're smart enough to do that. The problem is they didn't know where it was at, and it happened to them. That's what he's saying to us. Evil times, evil events happen to us. We don't know where they're going to come from. They just unexpectedly happen to us. How do we respond? What are we to do? So now he's going to use an example story to teach another thing about wisdom. Wisdom and crisis, how do we respond to crisis? But then he's going to talk about another story where wisdom was exercised, but the, the expectant, what we would expect to happen didn't happen. Look at verses 13 through 16. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. He was so impressed with this. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. So here we have a person exercising wisdom that actually saves a city, and you would think the response would be as wow, let's throw a party to honor this guy. And instead, they rejected him. They didn't reward him. In fact, they despised him. That's not what one would expect. The contrast is displayed by the vast resources of the great king and the small city and the few men. You see the contrast going on? Great and small. That's why he's he's painting this picture for us here. Whether it's a real-life event, we're not sure, or whether it's just something he made up as a story, we're not sure. Could be a real life event. Wisdom has great value, but wisdom is often attacked. If you can stomach it, and I'm not real good at it, and I haven't really gotten over it yet, but if you can stomach it, post something wise on Facebook and see what people say. Send out a tweet of something that's wise. And again, wisdom is, of course, truths pertaining to the, to, the, to the revelation of God, what God has spoken about, what is true. Post something, tweet something about wisdom and see how it's responding. Wisdom has great value, but often people say, I don't want to hear that. It's attacked. They didn't even remember him. Now, the word remember doesn't mean they forgot about him. The word remember has a connotation of reward. They did not reward him. They did not honor him with a party. They did not put a plaque in the city square saying, this person saved us by his wisdom. No, they didn't remember him at all. They completely forgot him. So the word remember conveys the idea of reward. And it's used in 1 Samuel 25 with that connotation. My Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. In other words, reward your servant for my faithfulness. That's the idea. It's it's being rewarded. So he exercises wisdom, and they throw him off. They take his wisdom to save the city, but afterwards they they didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want anything from him. The poor man acted on behalf of the city and saved it, but did not get rewarded for it. So what do we do? We exercise wisdom, we get attacked. We exercise wisdom, no one rewards us for us. So what are we, t- what are we gonna do? Are we gonna continue to be wise people? Or are we just gonna say, it's not worth it. I don't wanna be attacked. I like the rewards. I'm gonna do it differently. What are we gonna do? That's a question that Martin Niemöller was faced with. What are you gonna do? It was a time of Hitler's Germany. And Martin Niemöller was a Lutheran pastor. And this picture right here, is actually when he was released in the concentration camp, Dachau. He went to Dachau in the concentration camp. This is when he was being released, and he was going to give a, uh, a, 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 an interview with reporters there. So he had, this, he had this dilemma. What am I going to do? I see this tyrant, Hitler. 
I see what he's doing to the Jewish people. I see what he's doing to our nation. I see what he's doing to the churches. We've seen pictures of churches. Churches that on a table, similar like that, is a Nazi flag flying. You'd say, that never happened in our church. You're absolutely right, that's never going to happen in our church. But it happened in churches in Germany. And the churches were falling apart. They didn't know what to do. There's all of these things going on politically, ethically in their nation. And he says, enough. Enough. He started a movement that grew into what we know as the Confessing Church, the church that opposed Hitler and his policies. Hitler hated uh, 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 Niemöller and actually threw him in 1908, arrested him and threw him in prison in 1938. As he was being led down a long hallway for his trial, he heard a voice quietly quoting in Latin a verse from the book of Proverbs, that is Proverbs 18.10. Now this is Latin, and if you know Latin, so I'm sorry, I'm sure I'm not saying it correctly. Nomen Domini Turius Fortiismus, which simply means the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And this guard was quoting this in Latin as, as, uh, as Nimrod walked by, he heard it, and it became confidence to him that God was, was working in his life, that God was his strong tower. No matter what the Nazis tried to do, God was still in control. It gave him great strength. It was a call for Nimrod to have courage even as he entered the lion's den. It gave him strength to face what lay ahead. So he was imprisoned in Dachau, a terrible place. A lot of people died there. He survived seven years in the concentration camp, and he came out to help rebuild the church in Germany. Wisdom acts on behalf of others without the expectation of reward. He said, this is the right thing. I cannot allow Hitler or his policies or this government to dictate to the church what the gospel message is or to tell us what we can do or what we can't do or to throw Jews or, or the people practicing homosexualities or gypsies, all the people that were thrown in the concentration camps. I oppose this. And he was vocal about it. He was wise about it. Even if we don't get rewarded, wisdom is the right thing to do. Reward is nice, but it's not necessary to do the right thing. And I'm sure that's happened to you in your life. I'm sure you've done the right thing one time. I shouldn't say that one time. That sounds terrible. As if you've only done it one time. You've probably done the, the right thing multiple times and never got rewarded for doing it. You know what I'm talking about. So the question you ask yourself is, why do I want to be wise anymore? I'm not getting rewarded. In fact, people are looking down and attacking me. I wish our politicians would exercise this kind of wisdom. It seems like they only are there for their own self-interest, and that's their votes. They're not there for the good of the nation, it seems like. It seems like they're, they're just get voted in again the next time. We need, we need leaders who will do the right thing when it's the right thing to do, even if you're attacked, or even if people don't reward you. It's the right thing to do. When things get really bad in a society, wisdom is sought for to provide answers. The city was about to be destroyed by a great king with all of his resources. The city was in turmoil. It turned to the person that had wisdom for help. So I say to us, knowing the state of our society right now, I can only speak about America, knowing the state of our society right now and what's transpiring in it, and if you don't know, please pay attention to what's happening in our society. I say to us Christians, let's prepare our hearts today to receive the wisdom of God so we can aid our society when things go bad. I mean, really bad. It's going to look for wisdom. It's going to look for help. Let's be those kind of people who have God's wisdom to know how to apply it to a current situation we find ourselves in society. God's way, His wisdom, is always the best way. It's always the best way. So happy is the city or the nation that has wise people that can spare the city or the nation its hardships. And blessed is a city or nation that heeds the advice of wise people. Wisdom provided great value for the city, but it had no lasting value for the man. There was no reward for him. As a matter of fact, he was despised. You may use wisdom and save the day, but never be rewarded. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with that? 
will you still be wise even if you know you're not going to be rewarded for being wise? Wisdom understands that the world still needs wisdom. So this wise person, it was his station in society. That's why Solomon mentioned he was a poor man. His station in society really was the reason he was disregarded. They listened to his wisdom, but he, because he was a poor person, they didn't want to listen to anything else he had to say. Proverbs 14 says, The poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. So he didn't just arbitrarily put the word poor in there without reason. God said, this is a description of his station in society, and they didn't want to hear anything more from him because he was a poor man. He was on lower rungs of society. He, he really, he must have just had a one-off, a fluke, that he came up with this great idea to save the city. I don't, we, we didn't listen to him anymore after that. See, people are so vain and foolish. They, they put more stock in outward show than wisdom, which is really an inward quality. Often the counsel given by the lower in society has great value if we'll listen to them. I, I was at a city council meeting in Arnstadt, Germany when we were there. I thought, yeah, I'd like to know how the city functions and it'd be interesting to, to practice my language skills, to pay attention to what's happening in the city. So I went to the city council meeting. And I was just, I didn't, I didn't it, they had an open mic where you can get up and talk. There was a problem in the city they wanted a solution for. So they were asking people in the city to give ideas. I said, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. So I sat there and listened, and one lady came up there, and she had a superb suggestion. I thought, this is great. This is exactly what they're going to need to do because this, this will work. This is great. Do you know what the city council said to her, the city council person in charge asking the question? You know what they said to her after she had a great suggestion? What did you get your degree in, and which school did you attend? She goes, I didn't get a degree, and I didn't attend a school. Okay, thank you. Sit down. I couldn't believe it. I thought that was the best suggestion I heard from anyone. But because she didn't have the right pedigree, she didn't have the right educational structure, they discarded her. Because of this man's station in society, he wasn't listened to. Then he's going to close with two proverbs. And he's basically going to say this. The one who shouts the loudest often believes they are absolutely right and all others are wrong. Now, I know you just had about three bosses flash before your face right now. I got it. I understand. Okay. You were, those in the military, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Those who, who, who yell the loudest think that they're often right and everyone else is wrong. So look at verses then. Here are the last two verses of 17 and 18. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroys much good. So now he talked about wisdom in crisis. He's talking about wisdom not being rewarded. Now he's going to talk about wisdom and leadership. The wise person is seldom loud but conveys truth in a humble way. You see, when you have the truth, and again, not my truth, your truth, the truth. When you have the truth, you don't have to be loud about it. You don't have to scream and yell to get your point across. It is the truth. And you just lay it out there. Whether they're going to believe it or not is up to them. It is the truth. Proverbs 15 one says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We don't have to be loud when we're conveying the truth. You don't have to text in all caps. Okay? You don't. It's not necessary, Solomon says. The wise person offers their counsel quietly, calmly, and humbly, even when it's rejected. We are passionate about the truth, but we are not arrogant. The violent use of force is shown as the ruler shouting. He's trying to get his point across by being louder and louder and louder. Whether he's the fool or he's just among fools, or both of them are fools, or all of them are fools, he thinks his shouting will get his point across, that, he, that truth is, is in loud words. No. Because the loudest voice is most often not the wisest. Now, please don't think ill of your boss if he yells at you tomorrow, okay? Or yells in a meeting tomorrow. Don't say, what an unwise person, foolish person that guy is. It's just the truth. The loudest voice is most often not the wisest. Why? Because we think by force we have to get our point across. Truth is truth. Put it out there. 
Let people see what the truth is. Let them be, they're responsible how they're going to respond to it. An anonymous person says, a, as a man grows wiser, he talks less and says more. Now that's good. I like that. When you become wiser, you talk less and you say more. Even when there is much wisdom present, a little folly, a little sin can mess things up dramatically. See, the opponent of wisdom is the sinner. He didn't say the foolish, you notice that. There is an equation in Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes of the foolish and the sinner being together. But the idea is, it is, takes on a moral quality to it. Those who reject wisdom are immoral people, is what he's saying. You're a sinner. You're an immoral person. That's what he's trying to say to us. For one unwise person or sinner can derail the wisdom of a hundred wise people. Proverbs 13 says, Good sense wins favor, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. And a foolish advisor is dangerous to a nation. An immoral sinner who is not exercising biblical wisdom is dangerous to a nation. And then he says, one sinner destroys much good. And you think, well, that must be moral good, goodness, you know, goodness, badness. It, that's not what the word actually means. It actually has the idea of possessions and prosperity, or we would say goods. Those are his goods. That's the idea there, his possessions and prosperity. So you destroy an awful lot in society when you're immoral, unwise, foolish person. You destroy society. People may refuse to listen or heed biblical wisdom, but wisdom is still better. It's better than weapons of warfare. It's better than might. Wisdom is always better, even though those reject it. J.I. Packer, who was an author and writer, author and speaker, said this. Imagine that you're in New York City subway station. You will see trains come in and go out, but you only get a general view of what's going on. However, if you step inside the control room, you'll see a large display with tiny lights representing each train in the entire system. In a glance, you will be able to, to survey the entire situation through the eyes of those in control. You will see why one engine is signaled to stop and another has been diverted and why another sits on a sidetrack. So, so Packer makes this comment. The mistake that is commonly made is to suppose that this is an illustration of what God does when he bestows wisdom. God gives a person insight into the meaning and purpose of events going on around us. We then have the ability to see why God, uh, why God has done what he has done in a particular case and what he's going to do next. People who think this is what wisdom is imagine that if they walk close enough to God, they will be in God's command center and will understand everything that happens. But God's wisdom doesn't work this way. God's wisdom is more like learning to drive a car. When you drive a car, it's important to make the right responses to the constantly changing scene around you. You have to judge how fast to go. You have to keep how much distance to keep between you and the next car and when to put on the brakes. Drivers simply try to see and to do the right thing in the actual situation that presents itself. Having wisdom from God, he says, does not mean we understand everything that is going on because of our superior knowledge. It means we do the right thing as life comes along. Every moment, every day, day in and day out, that's biblical wisdom. Crises happen. Uh, be wise anyway. Often there's no reward with wisdom. And I say again, be wise anyway. The foolish will scream the loudest against all that is wise counsel. And I say, be wise anyway. That's what Solomon wanted us to hear. Let's pray. Father, we hear what Solomon is saying because we have seen it also in our lives. We have seen the unexpected happen. That which was the opposite of what we expected, it took place. We expected one thing and another thing happened. And we don't understand. But we do know that you are good and that you are just and that you are sovereign. You are our Heavenly Father who loves us. Oh, you love us so deeply. You want the best for us. 
You have given us your word that we can be wise people in this world, that we can take your principles, apply them day in and day out in every situation we find ourselves in as we grow in wisdom. We want to be wise people. We know someday this nation is going to need wisdom. It needs it right now. So, Father, I pray that you would, through your word and your spirit, grace us with the gift of wisdom that we may be wise as we live our life under the sun. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.